The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. From the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, this is Legend is Legends. I'm Jason Bryant. Prepare for a journey through wrestling's past, present, and future as we'll hear the great stories of wrestling and success from the true legends of the sport here on Hall of Fame Legends. Beginning his wrestling career as a junior in high school, Dominic Pudwell Gorey always set his sights high. As a wrestler at Palmetto High School in Miami, he forged a standout career record of 41 wins, 9 defeats, and 1 tie. He received an appointment to the United States Naval Academy in 1975 and wrestled four years for legendary coach Ed Peary, who was inducted as a distinguished member of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1980. Gorey received his Bachelor of Science degree in Ocean Engineering from the Naval Academy in 1979 and his Master's in Aviation Systems from the University of Tennessee in 1990. He was designated as a naval aviator and piloted fighter jets aboard the USS America, the USS Coral Sea, and USS Roosevelt from 1981 to 1992, where he accumulated more than 600 carrier landings. Gorey also flew 38 combat missions in Operation Desert Storm. Gorey was ordered to the United States Space Command in 1992 and was selected as an astronaut candidate in 1994. He reported to the Johnson Space Center in 1985, and following a year of training and evaluation, Gorey was assigned to work safety issues at the astronaut office. He served as a spacecraft communicator in mission control for numerous space shuttle flights and was a chief of the astronaut shuttle branch. In June of 1998, his most lofty goal was achieved with the first of two shuttle missions as a pilot, followed by two more as mission commander. Gorey, who retired from NASA in 2010, has logged a total of 49 days in space. He's received five Medal of Citation honors, including the Distinguished Flying Cross in both 1992 and 2010. He also received the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, and the Legion of Merit from 1995 to 2002. For his achievements as an astronaut and his military service to his country, Dominic Gorey is honored as an outstanding American by the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Class of 2017. And come in, I thought, and we opened it up and there was, they had put our these astronaut biographies in there and we started messing with it. And so <laughs> um, I put in there that something about my daughter being a hip hop star. And then I wrote that I was, I was training as a cage fighter for the UFC <laughs> in this Wikipedia thing. And, um, and I wasn't, it was, it was, uh, it was a joke and it was up there for like a month maybe. And then it, I never really looked and it went away, I guess. But about two years later, an engineer was walking de- through the office at NASA and, and that I knew. And he came up and said, hey, Tom, you got to say, are you still training for, the, <laughs> for the, this MMA stuff? <laughs> and I was just shocked that uh, hey, it's on the Internet. It's got to be true. Somebody had seen it. Got to yeah. be true. So here with 2017 National Wrestling Hall of Fame inductee, outstanding American Dominic Dom Gorey, as if you've gone by for, I guess, probably most of your adult life. And first off, what's it mean to you to be uh, receiving this honor this year as an outstanding American by the Hall of Fame? I think uh, I have to keep sort of hitting myself um, and uh, and reminding myself, like my daughter did, that um, I'm not here because of my, my wrestling skill, um, but because of what it allowed me to um, to do with with my life. And, and I think the wrestling experiences very clearly gave me um, a mindset, an approach to challenges, a way of dealing with things with tenacity when it needed um, that allowed me to do some pretty cool things, um, getting to fly airplanes and, and jets and certainly flying in space. I attribute to that, to that mindset that purely came from wrestling. You're an astronaut and had spent time in the Navy, retired from the, you know, retired as a captain, correct? Yes. And then into the, into the space program. When you look back at going at your life and, and starting wrestling, I mean, there's, there's a wrestling tie to everybody that comes into this, these halls in Stillwater. But when did you first discover the sport of wrestling? When, 
we lived in Illinois. I think it was in eighth grade and we were getting ready to move. And there was an opportunity for a, a camp of sorts that was at the junior high level. And I did that for a couple of weeks, um, maybe a month and really found that I enjoyed it. There were some kids that were, uh, active in it, um, for a couple of years and, um, was able to push a couple of kids around that, um, made me realize that this is a pretty cool sport. And then we subsequently moved to Miami the next year, um, went to a huge school system and they had a, probably the, the best wrestling program in the state of Florida. And, and I was, uh, I found myself in that wrestling room in ninth grade and meeting some great friends, a sport that clicked with, with me and really enjoyed it and stayed with it, um, through college. What do you remember about your first ever wrestling match? What I remember, um, it was a wrestle off in, in junior high. And, um, there was a, a kid that was, um, in ninth grade with a beard and, uh, it didn't go well for me. He was, <laughs> he was, he was just way developed. Um, and I remember the coach, uh, saying that, you know, if you approach this, this challenge with, um, with, a a, a mindset, a, a, a drive, you will one day beat that kid because he's already developed, he's matured and you haven't yet. And that kind of approach to what was clearly a, a, a challenge that was almost, it seemed to be insurmountable at that point, um, was sort of the approach that I took through the, the rest of my wrestling career and, and into the, the military career. When did you realize that you were, you had become a wrestler? Um, well, I think when you, when I first, um, at that, at that junior high level, um, we all in that, that young man that, that I was competing, competing against, um, we sort of moved out into different weights and I was on this, this starting team in, in ninth grade, I think it was, um, and being with those guys as you are along the edge of the mat, um, and, and looking at teams that would come and visit and where we would go travel and, and compete against um, that uh, memory of standing with those guys, being on this team that was clearly successful um, and had developed um, a uh, camaraderie, a, 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 a teamwork approach to problems made it very clear that, Hey, this was pretty cool. Um, and also the, the great, thing about wrestling was that once you step back after the introductions, you went out there by yourself and it was all on you and your successes and your um, defeats were on your shoulders, which was, I think, a great preparation for life. How did you measure success back then? It was, you know, as a, as a young wrestler, it's, it's winning um, and losing and, um, I think as you mature, then it becomes much more of how you, how you did, how you felt about it. Did you do your best or not? Um, and, and if that was, um, kept as the priority, then it was much easier to, um, see, uh, how to get better. It was much easier to feel the rewards of the sport as it, I think it's truly meant to be as sport is supposed to be. Um, and it shouldn't all just be about winning and losing. Um, but doing your, your best became sort of a, even at that young age, a, a mantra for, for, uh, pressing on. Um, that was how my career in the military worked. Um, certainly at the Naval Academy and doing your best. If it truly is, and there's not many people that, that really do that, that really do their best. Um, so if you can get close to that, you, you're going to succeed almost all the time. A lot of these type of situations where, where wrestlers develop that, that desire for success and that, that doing their best comes from a coach. How instrumental in your 
wrestling career and then in your life was your wrestling coach through all this and building these these bonds? I think, yeah, your coaches are always these pseudo father figures in uh in high school, our coach was extremely demanding. We had this great program that built out of the junior high. Um, and his, his method was, was just perseverance through unbelievable rigorous practices and drills. And, um, and, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, um, technical instruction. He was a football coach mainly. Um, but a good motivator, but we were crazy motivated. And and went out there with this sort of a you'd you'd let this sort of inner tenacity unleash. Um and it was a powerful thing just having that mental aggression that not many other teams had. When you got to the when I got to the Naval Academy, then Coach Perry, uh, multiple time national champ, superstar of in his own right, had a technical approach. Um and the challenges for the wrestling program at the Naval Academy is is way different than most other Division One programs, of course, with the time restrictions and things. But he truly was a technician, a wonderful motivator, just a, a great coach from the from just a pure wrestling background. Some of that you lost your father at an early age. How much of that maybe played a role into drawing you into the sport of wrestling, where you have coaches who are a lot more tight knit and, and, and it's more like a family than other sports can be. Yeah, yeah. Losing my dad early was certainly the path that allowed me to go to the Naval Academy, and my interest in flying was because, because he was a he was a pilot. he was an Air Force pilot. Um, and despite the fact that he lo- he lost his life in an airplane crash, <laughs> I was still fascinated with airplanes. Um, How did that make your mom feel? That's what I want to know well, right away. That's what came to mind just as I said that. <laughs> I found myself often um, telling stories when I got, went home about flying and that kind of thing. And I'd look at this face that she had on and, and I and I realized that I was scaring her. Um, so I would often change the subject and that kind of thing. But um, I, I'm sure I can't. Im- I actually, I'm not sure. I can, can't imagine after losing a spouse to have one of your children go off and do this crazy stuff and climb on a rocket and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I'm sure she was really scared, but, uh, but that losing my dad and his, uh, his, uh, um, the loss of a father, I think probably places a lot more emphasis on how you view your coach. And I think coaches need to be aware of the power that they have over this, spectrum of um, backgrounds that are in the it's in their room and and truly good coaches are going to realize that there are great differences between wrestlers and how to approach them how to motivate them how to reach them is a skill that most managers high level managers don't have Um, but coaches have to achieve that if they want to have success because there's so many different ways that you reach wrestlers based on where they're coming from and what they're looking for. Now here comes the cool part. I want to know when do you first decide that this NASA thing, the space program that was really on its, it's that we was fledgling when you were coming through high school and then in, into college, when do you go, I want to fly in space? Um, because there's a distinguished military career (laughs) between there that we'll get to, but I'm, I'm, you know, I think you're an astronaut. I remember very clearly sitting in a living room and watching a moon landing and watching a guy step out and, and, and walk on the moon and thinking, holy cow, that's the coolest thing. So you'd have been about what, eight or nine around that time? Is that about right? 10 years old. Yeah. Um, and it was a family thing. Everybody was gathered around the television. I remember it clearly. Um, but that, that memory is, is the same as an eight year old watching Jordan Burroughs or Kyle Snyder, you know, win a gold medal in wrestling now. It, it's so far out there that it's, it, it truly is just a, a dream kind of thing. But in my Navy career, as I became a test pilot, it became, that was the last step to, that you needed to have in your resume before you realistically applied to be an astronaut. Once you're a test pilot um, with that um, background, now you can be in the pool of, of astronaut 
selectees or, you know, applicants. And, uh, and so I did that as soon as I finished that initial test pilot training and started chasing that, that dream. Yo, what's, what's, what age are most people when they get to be an astronaut? So I know there's been several wrestlers that are known to have been astronauts, you know, Joe Allen for one of them. And, uh, Kel recently who has been making some, some waves in, in terms of wrestling people age wise, where are you at in your career when the opportunity to join NASA or become an astronaut opens the door, opens the door. You have to, it's certainly not at the beginning of your career because NASA wants to see demonstrated, um, professionalism and, and demonstrated expertise, uh, and performance. So you, in the military, most guys are coming in, in their very early thirties. They've been flying, uh, for several years, have demonstrated, uh, a, a sustained kind of performance in a squ- at a squadron or as a test pilot. Um, and, and then as a, as a space shuttle pilot, you had to be a, a test pilot that comes, on your second or third tour in the military. So mid thirties, enough time to, uh, to mature and mostly demonstrate that you're more than just book smart, that you can put it into practice. When it comes to the opportunity to go into space, it's something that the very small percentage of this population's had the opportunity to do. And then there's also a very much larger population that's had the opportunity to serve in the United States Armed Forces. You've served several tours of duty. What was Desert Storm like? Because like you watching the moon landing, I was 10, 11 years old watching that scenario unfold on television. So completely different scenario. But I remember our family watching what was going on. Mm -hmm. What was the experience like for you? Desert Storm was like a wrestling season. Um I like yeah. how you just tied that into wrestling. So we can go with that. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't just a, a one day thing. There was a sustained um, couple months of performance that was demanded. And the approach to it was was fairly similar to it. You had to be in, in it for the long haul. Um, it was very uh, nerve wracking at the beginning when the uh, the enemy was unknown there. They were. The Iraqi Air Force was, and their military was touted to be the, you know, third most powerful air defense system in the world, and until we clearly saw that we were dominant in that in that arena, you weren't quite sure how each day was going to go. Um, similar to how you might approach a season of of, of wrestling, but. Once you got experience, once you got confidence, once you knew that you were up to the task, then you could be more aggressive. You could sort of unleash um, different approaches to to problems. And um, it became, after several weeks of flying combat missions, it became um, a different game than it was at at the beginning. Um, And I imagine how you would... Once you would gain confidence in a in your ability on a in a sport or in, in wrestling, you could um, gain um, you would gain confidence. You would have maybe have a different approach and relax a little bit, and then truly, it became a, a sort of a inertia, um, a building of inertia and in, in, in strength and power of our military, and the especially from the the carrier. Um, squadrons that were doing a lot of the attacks in the, in the Northeast. Um, it, uh, it was almost, it was over pretty quickly that they just couldn't compete against us. That situation going into what amounted to a war in this country hadn't been in a wartime situation. There'd been skirmishes here and there, but what was it like for your generation of, of pilots going into that, knowing that there wasn't a generation right before you, um, that had had direct experience. The people that had experience were your parents, typically, or you know the, the the pilot's parents. How did that play with your mind as you went into that conflict? It it left you with a, a big unknown. You didn't know um, how all your training was going to play out. You didn't know how the um, the enemy uh, was going to react. And a little more serious than a than a wrestling match. But when when missiles are coming up, um, that's a very very powerful incentive to 
to oh, be to yeah. be to, <laughs> to, to be at your best and um and it but it very similar to wrestling it was like when you saw that when things started unfolding on a on a mission that um you had thought about it trained about you reacted and and um and you came to this clarity of thought and action that uh didn't have a whole lot of um, direct comprehension. It was, it was, you were reacting and, and, and letting skills that were embedded in you take over. Um, but yeah, very similar to wrestling in the mindset. Um, and that you had to get into this kind of um, ferocity before you launched um, to, to deal with it because it, it truly was, you know, life and death kind of thing. When you go from being a test pilot to be now in the pool for NASA, how does the process go to where you ultimately get selected? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you can probably draw a wrestling correlation with there's basically you're, you're wrestling off for those spots. <laughs> what was that experience like? So the NASA would put out at that time, a call for astronauts about every two years. And from the military, um, side the each service the air force and the navy and the marines would would send out a notice and uh, messages to their um uh pilots that this application process was starting and so you went through or i went through a, a navy selection process and they basically took all of the uh, test pilots um and put them in this pool and i think it was rare to not get you know sent up to the nasa selection from that from that pool um, because the test pilots had a very common background. They were academically sound and demonstrated, you know, performance in, in squadrons. And then as a test pilot, um, but then NASA gets a couple thousand applications from around the country and they select a board um, that has maybe 15 people in it. Most of them astronauts and they start screening all of these applications and small things might be discriminators. Your grade point average in college, or maybe well, I'm out, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe um, experience with a certain project. Um, but and maybe uh, something as small as like your uh, you're not 2020 vision. Is it something sim something as small well, as that? The medical part of it came um, into play. If you were selected for an interview, they would bring you in, and in an our classes case, I think there was about 150 people brought in to interview over a few week period um, and then subsequently picked a class of 23 people. So there was several folks in that big pool that that were um, deselected because of some maybe even unknown medical condition. But they would probe every part of your body and uh, and um, determine if if you met the requirements because the 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 pool is so common that they often did use fairly small discriminators. Uh, but the medical part of it pulled some folks out, but it all came down to an interview. And you sat at a, a table with those 15 people around you. And they asked you very, very simple questions, um, starting back maybe with junior high or high school. And they would, the question would be very innocuous, open-ended. So tell me about your experience in high school. And it was very clear from the beginning, um, having sat on a selection board at, you know, much later as an astronaut, how people answered those questions, how they viewed themselves and how they viewed people around them and how, how they viewed teams. And if someone would remind the board that their SAT level or SAT score, their grade level was a certain, um, you know, stratospheric kind of number, the board already knew that, but it became apparent that maybe their view of themselves was not what you would want to, to have inside a, a spaceship for two weeks. You would want a group of people that got along together really well. They were funny, that had stories to tell. And it was clear to be even in the room as a, as a interviewer, interviewee, that you probably had a pretty good academic background. Um, but you want to pick a group of folks that they're going to get along together well and, uh, 
and not want to be thrown out of the spaceship after a week. So when you see these these Hollywood movies, there's always the the wild man, the cowboy. I mean, is that kind of true to life for the personalities that they put together on these these type of missions? There's always a few, you know, great funny personalities, and and a lot of people can rise to that occasion. They can they can pull that out of their their back pocket and, and be that wild person or funny person when it's appropriate. But there is not that rogue personality. Um, you hope that you can screen that out in the interview process. And we're really good at that, at doing that. But every once in a while, there's, there's a spectrum of people and there's introverts and there's extroverts. And that's what made flying in space really, really fun was having this group of people that, that were from all over the the map of experiences, but were also really wonderful to be with. And there was some funny people and there were some serious people, um, just like most teams and most families. How much did wrestling come up during your interview process? Um, so I remember it, it, it came up um, just, Hey, tell me about your wrestling experience. And, and I, I recall just trying to relay how much wrestling meant to me, how, how it sort of gave me the, the tools to, to approach problems. Um, but I also remember being on a selection board and, and interviewing uh, a young man from, uh, that had gone to West Point. And, uh, and I think I was a little bit mean to him because I, uh, I asked him when he said that he was on the very successful Army team, um, and I asked him if he remembered the, the record of Army versus Navy in the last 35 years. And, and Army had only won twice in, in 35 years. Um, so I was a bit uh, harsh on it. So you're pretty sure he knew. Because <laughs> everybody knows that. Everybody that wrestles at either academy knows that record. Yes. One way or the other. Yeah. How different is it when flying a mission in a, in a combat situation like Iraq and then flying a mission into space where – the end result can still end up very bad. Whereas in space, you don't have anybody shooting at you yet. There's that, that great vacuum that any mistake you guys are done, just like in combat, any mistake you guys are done. How do you balance that? And how, how are they similar and how are they different? You know, f flying um, off of carriers is very, very similar to flying in space. The, the consequences of a, of a mistake are, are huge. Um, the big difference with f flying F-18s was it was a, a single seat airplane and you had to develop a, a method of uh, approaching problems of a checklist, a mental checklist and written checklist that ensured that you didn't miss anything. And once you f were in a, say, a, a, on a combat mission, um, those um, training uh, evolutions and, and uh, practices that you had gone through sort of are brought into play just like in, in wrestling. Um, in space, on a shuttle crew, on the uh, flight deck, there was four people. And as a pilot and a commander, your biggest challenge was to try to integrate all four of those people together to try to um, analyze, to try to predict, to try to isolate problems or mistakes. Um, there was so many switches and controls and procedures that if you utilized a, a method of um, cockpit resource management, they call it, of backing each other up, you could prevent maybe to a much uh, higher level any mistakes that were made. The consequences of making a mistake in space is much greater than making a, a mistake in an airplane. It, uh, the, the environment is much harsher. So the, the requirements to, to achieve almost perfection is huge, but they did happen. People would make a mistake or maybe type in a, something um, incorrectly in a, all our flights. All of those were captured and their, the effects were, were minimized because there's usually a sequence of events that w might lead to a, to a problem. Um, the biggest challenge was to, to take these people, astronauts that were so focused on perfection, um, that when they made a mistake, um, you had to very quickly recognize, even if it was a very tiny, tiny thing, 
um, that that astronaut was probably greatly affected mentally for some period of time and to try to bring them back into the game, how to regain their confidence, um, to ensure that they would get back into the, the, um, the team that were, was requiring them to do their job um, was a challenge. And uh, um, there was methods of doing that, of recognizing it, to, of making light of it or getting, making sure that they were back consciously aware and, and could put it behind them. That was the biggest, the challenge was overcoming a small mistake so that you could get back um, into the sequence and the procedures that you were um, you were in the midst of, and uh, and and press on. Um, but if you did it right, if you had a great team that um, was self self deprecating and didn't take themselves too serious, then it it was much easier. But most astronauts are are really um, uh, rigorous in, in in demanding of their own perfection. As we wrap up here in the 2017 Outstanding American, and based on the stories we've just heard in the last half hour, you definitely seem to be a very outstanding American. Curious on what tips that you might have for this generation that's coming through, because we've got a technological savvy group of individuals that are coming now through the, the service academies. They're adept at being able to think on their feet. They're constantly being attacked by uh, a barrage of distractions, as we see with, you know, a lot of the kids are super medicated with the ADD, like, I, I can't, you know, attention deficit and whatnot. There's so many distractions on kids nowadays. What advice do you have for somebody that may be a wrestler or maybe a, a football player or you're just maybe a, a chess savant that wants to be an astronaut and wants to have a naval career or a career in the Air Force or the Army or any branch of the armed services? What have you learned that's been kind of a, the most important guiding principle of your career? I th I think the... Um, approach to problems, um, the, the rigorous structured kind of way of, of approaching, um, a goal or a challenge that you have is, is ever the, the challenge is ever increasing for all the reasons you just said. Um, most of our athletes have a tendency to, to focus solely on, on that and to maybe ignore the other opportunities that they've got in front of them. Um, an education, uh, the, uh, job environment, um, is so varied that having all of those tools, not just a strong and tough, um, wrestler's body, um, and strength and quickness and all those things. But having also the, the mental approach to uh, challenges is going to make a huge difference in their, in their lives. And if you can combine those two things together, both a, a physical part and a intellectual part, um, you're going to be a success no matter what the number of people that can keep wrestling and, and rely only on, on that, physical part of it is very, very small. And we all want to be that guy. We want to be the gold medal in the Olympics kind of guy. But the truth is that something is, is going to come in, in your way um, and in your path, that's going to make you choose something other than wrestling for, for almost everyone. And having that spectrum of experiences, um, but to use wrestling as part of your toolkit to approach problems um, al allows, I think, us to to achieve almost anything we want. So uh, a young person that can be broad in their experiences and not ignore um, the intellectual, the academic part of, of growing up, um, and then the the opportunities that they're going to have in the future are, are unknown are totally um, are going to be a surprise to them. But having a goal in mind, having something short-term and long-term goals in mind that you stay focused on, um, it's going to be an, a, an incredible adventure. I wish I could go back and be, be in junior high again and, and start it over and maybe do the same thing or do it uh, some, something something um, 
just as exciting, but the opportunities as they're unfolding in, in, in just our modern society, I think are going to be unbelievable. Um, getting to fly maybe outside of Earth's orbit or beyond the moon, out to Mars, or, you know, I think that's just a small analogy to the different things that are going to be available technologically. Um, and now the Outstanding American Award is described as recognizing individuals who have used what they learned in wrestling to launch notable careers after concluding their wrestling career. Our Outstanding American for this year is Dominic Pudwell Gorey, who actually did launch his first career as a fighter pilot of all carriers and then four times off this uh, space shuttle. So speaking about Dom today is going to be Mike Peterson, a friend, teammate, and nominator. All right. No problem. We can do that. Thank you all for putting this whole thing together and being a part of this. Uh, it's an honor to be in the same room as guys such as Tony, Carrie, Andre, Chuck, Tom, Greg, Mike, Dad. Um, the, the athletic and professional achievements of each of these guys is, is truly staggering. But to diverge from the stat sheets, quantitative data, and resume, I'm going to provide a little insight into the heart of who my dad is and how he helped shape my life. When I was six years old, uh, my dad helped coach my Little League coach pitch team, and he was the pitcher. So our Little League field was asymmetrically shaped, right field being significantly shorter than left and center. And each time I came up to bat, he would toss me these high and outside pitches that I was able to wait on so I could hit him over the, the right field fence. It wasn't, it wasn't cheating. He was just giving me a leg up. And he's given me a leg up in a litany of ways, but three main prevailing examples come to mind. The first, he fostered an unrelenting intrinsic drive within me by creating an environment for me to grow up in that allowed me to hunt down and pursue and achieve my goals on my own with no exterior pressure. He consistently made himself available to facilitate my development, but never forced it on me. And it, for an example, anytime I wanted to go hit baseballs to practice, he would throw me countless buckets of balls, never criticizing my swing, but more importantly, never overly praising it. And he would never only offer advice if I asked for it. He would spend endless hours rebounding thousands of my jump shots when I was in the gym, uh, putting up shots, never criticizing never overly praising and only offering advice if I wanted to, because he knew if I truly wanted to be successful, it would have to come from within me and not from him, not from my mom and not from any materialistic motivators. And this intrinsic drive that he established in me nurtured a competitive nature that has uh, directly led me to where I am today. The second example um, is his undying faith and support in me. A perfect example is when I was a sophomore at the Naval Academy, um, I decided to disobey a direct order from a commander in 05 in the Navy, sneak out and go to a party with my friends. And lo and behold, uh, spoiler alert, I got caught <laughs> and, and received the maximum punishment that the uh, Naval Academy had to offer. I got demoted, spent three months on restriction, and uh, didn't get to go home for Thanksgiving. Um, and in this moment, I thought my chances of becoming a SEAL were completely ruined. I never thought I was going to be able to realize my goals. But my dad never, never doubted me for a second. Um, but I had, I had more doubts. I decided that I was going to drop out of the academy, enlist, and go to Bud's as an enlisted man. But when I told my dad of my new plans, he um, looked at me like I had something growing out of my forehead. <laughs> and he said something like, if you don't get picked up, um, I'll eat my left foot. And... In, in this moment, his uh, undying faith in me, even in this uh, detour from the road to my goal, he didn't have a doubt. And in the end, everything worked out, and he still has both his feet. <laughs> so, the, uh, the third example is um, his leadership through example. And a mantra that I try to live by, um, fall short of fairly regularly, but try to live by nonetheless, is don't 
be a wussy and do the right thing. Don't be a wussy and do the right thing. If in everything that you do, you ensure that you're doing the right thing and you're not being lazy or a wimp about it, I guarantee you that you will find an incredible amount of fulfillment and success in your life. And no one embodies this more than my dad. Whether it be waking up at 5 a.m. to go climb a mountain with a 40-pound pack on in December and January in Colorado, whether it be building his own house with his own two hands with no help, or whether it be taking time off from what we can all consider a fairly demanding job to fly across the country in the summertime to go watch me play basketball. The, uh, the leadership by example that he's given me by, by embodying this mantra is, is truly a testament to how I've cheated the system growing up. And these three examples are just three of many in, in the way that he shaped my life. And my life is just one of many that he's had a profound impact on. Thank you guys. Well, now we're going to go go back. <laughs> now we're going to go back, and we're going to actually hear from Mike Peterson, who's a friend, a teammate, and one of the nominators. So come on up. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to pull this thing way down. Uh, and there's Peterson's mess up the Peterson name. I don't know what the heck it is, but we'll fix that one. Uh, Hey, Dom, Wendy, I mean, that's a tough, tall glass of water that you uh, produced right there. So that's one of the few times the Marine Corps let the Navy go first. So write that down. That was history right here. Did that on purpose. Did you start the clock yet? Yeah. Okay. Now, nah, okay. I just want to make sure. I'll give you an extra Thanks. Dom, Dom Gorey was the smartest, the strongest, the quickest, and the best-looking wrestler on our high school team in Miami. He was also in the best condition and was the most tenacious... Tena tena Dom, I can't read your writing here. <laughs> you set the clock back. <laughs> Dom, I'm honored to have known you since the early 70s when we were on the same Florida high school state championship team. Our coach, just like all coaches, had a lot of motivational sayings, pearls of wisdom, set your goals high, sky's the limit, shoot for the stars. Well, apparently, one young wrestler in our practice room was listening way too intently to that. <laughs> Took the words way too literal. The category of Outstanding American was no doubt devised and envisioned to honor wrestlers such as Dom Gorey. For the past few months, and even last night, you kept saying over and over, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is happening. Well, Dom, you are the most humble hero I've ever known. You deserve this honor and a recognition so, so much. However... <laughs> I do have to tell you something that I overheard last night at the reception. Two of the young wrestlers, people noticed that were serving, uh, they were whispering to each other and, and while they were working, and one of them said, hey, did you hear that there's going to be a four-time astronaut here tonight? I'm going to go try and get his autograph. Well, the other one looks over and he goes, the heck with that guy. I heard the Gazzoni guy is here, and I'm going to go over and get a picture with him. So... Dom, that's what it really means like to get Gazzoni. <laughs> I'm at the halfway mark here. <laughs> Submitting your nomination to the Hall of Fame was an easy thing to do. And persuading ESPN to interview you for my little brother's ESPN Pin Kings documentary, that was an easy thing to do too. And I loved watching you on there. Uh, you, uh, you don't owe me a thing because my compensation was watching you when they pulled the curtain up last night, and the liquid that was forming in your eyes, which you said was sweat, but I beg the difference. That was, that was the payment, and that's what I was looking for, so that, that was awesome. Uh, Dom's uh, NASA bio and his wrestling history, you, can, you guys can Google that and you find it online. He's one of only 10 astronauts in U.S. history 
to have flown in space four or more times. What people may not fully realize, though, is that a lot of those guys that have flown multiple missions are mission specialists in the back of the shuttle. And not to belittle the mission specialist, but Dom was a pilot twice and a mission commander twice. Uh, put that in perspective. I mean, he's, a, he's in a rare, rare category. Almost done. One quick story that Dom told me a while back, and it was about his first shuttle launch. Uh, he was the pilot of Discovery, first time in space, 1998. Now remember, Dom is the most humble. Uh, no kidding, he's the most humble guy that I know. It was a long 10-day flight. It was the final docking mission that uh, we had with the Russian Mir space station. He's the pilot of the shuttle. When the mission was complete, Dom's flying a shuttle. He's setting up for re-entry into the Earth, setting up for the long approach to Kennedy Space Center. Center. He's, uh, he's completely focused, disciplined. He's following all the checklists, just like Russ in practice, doing things over and over and over again. And now he's doing it for real. So, again, remember, he's the most humble guy I know. It's no time for early celebrating, right? It's no time to let your head start swelling up a little bit and start thinking about the crowd cheering you on as you're flying the shuttle in and landing and everybody's looking on TV and, and live. But Dom's human. He's, he's a humble human, but he's human. So after he lands and he rolls to a stop, he admits that he allowed himself a few moments to kind of pat himself on the back a little bit. It's kind of unusual for Dom. And uh, he, he, he kind of loses focus a bit. And as the other crew members start exiting the shuttle, he, uh, he starts envisioning how cool it's going to be to get off the shuttle, all the people watching, and just do his little post-flight and just kind of kind of feel pretty good about it. Well, like all good wrestlers, he also starts thinking about the what-ifs. You know, like, what if this tough wrestler on his first mission just couldn't handle the zero-G for 10 days? You know, what, what, what if his legs are weak? Uh, he just, you know, he stumbles down the stairs in front of the whole world, you know, and it's watching. He goes, it's, God, I can't. So he starts, he starts getting a little nervous. Yeah, he starts to sweat a little bit. Uh, and he's like, I don't know, we'll see. But all the other crew members are now off the space shuttle. Now, the mission commander sits in the front left. Again, Dom was the pilot, so he's sitting in the front right. Even the mission commander is off the shuttle. He's the only one sitting on the shuttle right now. And he's like, okay, it's time to get off. And so he puts his hands on his armrest and goes to push up, get out of his seat, fancy Nassau seat, and he can't get up. And he's like, holy, holy crap, I can't, I can't get out of my seat. I mean, this is bad. Maybe, maybe the zero G, I, this is embarrassing. I'm a wrestler. I can't get out of my seat. There's a delay now. Everybody's wondering where the pilot is. And just then, a Nassau specialist came in the door to the left off his left shoulder she taps him on the left shoulder. She says, Commander Gorey, it would help if you undo your seatbelt. <laughs> Dom, conclusion, he took everything that he learned from wrestling, applied it to his personal life and to his profession. There's no doubt about that. Dom, you are the most outstanding American that I know. Thank you so much, um, Sierra, Dayton, uh, Mike, Greg, Tom, Ned, Andre, Babe, Chuck, Karen, golly, to be with your class, um, I'll carry your bags anytime, <laughs> and I'll carry them fast, uh, we'll get them there, um, especially Sierra and Dayton, great things are coming, and, uh, I just wish y'all the best. Uh, my cup runneth over big time. Um, just so blessed. 
So my daughter, who's not here, just had a baby. And before she left, uh, we left her last uh, couple days ago. Uh, she said, Dad, I just remember, because I was starting to feel pretty good about myself. And she said, Dad, you know, they're not asking you there for your, your wrestling skill. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I can't quite accept that yet, but... Uh, <laughs> If there was ever a job to inflate your ego, um, it's being an astronaut. And I already had the largest helmet that NASA had. And, uh, and so when I told Wendy, I just found something to put on our fireplace mantle, this, this plaque thing. She said, well, only if you put your college record hanging in front of it. But we'll really let you do that. So I think it's going to be out in my, work, in my workshop with my other cool wrestling and space, space stuff. Uh, Doc, thank you for that awesome video coming out to Salida, Colorado, and and, uh, and doing that with me. Um, it was really, really fun, and uh, to be here now is, is just incredible. Um, so many people to thank. Uh, Wendy's kept me grounded for 35 years, sort of, and uh, and uh, we're about to get to 36 years, and and it couldn't have certainly done this without my family. Uh, the rest of you guys can argue all you want about who gets the silver and the bronze, but I get the gold medal for the best family, um, clearly. And, uh, and I appreciate them just being so supportive. There's not many folks that allow their spouse to go sit on a rocket, and, and not just once, but you know, a couple more times. And, and, uh, and they're always just there for me. I had a great um, wrestling background in high school with a, a program in, in Miami, um, that uh, we had great coaches, Coach Zimbler, and a great group of guys, including Mike, who just came up with me, and Mike and I were also at the Naval Academy, and um, he's like a campaigner. He, he could have got anybody elected. Um, that Bernie guy, anybody that wanted to run for president, yeah, Mike could do that for you, because he got me here, along with Jane and, and uh, Gary from Florida, the chapter. Uh, thank you guys so much. Cheryl Stewart, thanks for coming um, from so far away just to come and have dinner. This was really great. Um, at the Naval Academy, um, Coach Perry's got a couple of family members here, his sister and his, his daughter. He was a man of integrity, just a wonderful, wonderful guy, and also a father figure for um, the whole team. It was You're there away from home in a strange environment, especially like at the, one of the service academies, and uh, he was just a great guy. Um, so that was that was a powerful program to come from. Uh, so I know I'm missing a lot of folks to, to thank, but this hall and, and, and the group of people that are here, what you're doing to spread the the value and the power of the sport is is tremendous. Uh, I'll tell you a, a real quick story before I get down. And I was up in this small school in Leadville, Colorado. Uh, it's got the highest elevation golf course, highest elevation airport anywhere in, this, in the country. But it's got this little school that has asked me to come and talk to their fifth grade once in a while. And so I'm up there about six weeks ago, and this little girl raises her hand during question time, and she said, so besides academics, what made the difference to become an astronaut? And I, and I didn't even really hesitate. I said, well, the sport of wrestling and these Three little boys just sort of jumped out of their seats and they slammed each other's wrists and they, they knew that they were doing something that maybe was going to make it really cool in, in their life. Because I was telling them that this sport, wrestling, paved the way to, to get to go do some of these cool things. And I'm totally convinced that that's the case. The mindset. Um, and you can, the mindset of wrestling and you combine that with an intellectual curiosity and a, a rigorous analysis, and you can do anything. It's, I'm, I'm totally, totally convinced. Um, and then I followed them uh, that question up with describing. It's one of my like, favorite moments in space, and it's not sitting on the rocket and, uh, and lifting off, but it's the rendezvous. And when you're you're there as the as the commander, and you've you got your hands on the controls of this thing, and you're flying five miles a second, and you're flying in formation with a space station, and that. Earth is floating by underneath you, distracting you with, with every beautiful view that um, it has. And you're trying to maintain this tight corridor, flying um, 
closing at about a tenth of a foot per second, and you've got a dock with the tolerance is plus or minus three hundredths of a foot per second, and, and it's just it's this amazing experience. And I look back on that, and I think that that the approach to that, how you handle that, how you conduct it, is just like wrestling. And you don't have to be perfect, but you got to be pretty close, and you got to be really well prepared, and the whole team's got to be behind you. And, and I think that is what I'm trying to get across to this young girl in, in, in fifth grade when she asked me, "What prepared you for doing that?" And it's wrestling, and I. I am so appreciative of this is the face of wrestling and I and that's who I thank. I'm appreciative to all of you um, that make it possible uh, and it made it possible for me to to like take what I said a couple of cool business trips. So thank you so much. Legends is presented by the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and produced by the Matt Talk Podcast Network. If you want to hear more from wrestling's legends, contribute to this ongoing project at halloffamelegends.org slash contribute. One time and small monthly donation options are available. We hope you've enjoyed this look into wrestling history. This has been Legends. I'm Jason Bryant.